Hi everyone, it's Sandra, and this is my worm bin that I call Cinderella. Cinderella usually lives in my kitchen and gets everything we sweep off the floor, but she spent most of the spring and all of the summer outside. So I'm going to look in on her today and assess the moisture and tell you why I'm not concerned that this bin is getting a little dry. You can see the crunchy, chunky bits of bedding on the top, and there's Prince Charming, my adorable feeding zone indicator. I'll just put him somewhere safe. I consulted a couple published studies on the moisture preferences of Icinia fetida, the red wiggler worm, in preparation for this video. So if you wanna know how to make little worms grow up into big worms, how to make those big worms develop clitellum and start breeding, or some other factors to consider when looking at moisture in your worm bin, this is the video for you. The dry layer on the top doesn't tell the whole story of this worm bin. In fact, the research shows that the striations of different layers of a worm bin are pivotal to the growth and reproduction of red wigglers. Interestingly, worms will seek out the layer that has the best moisture for their state of development. I should point out that I'm talking about a worm bin that is designed to produce castings. If you have a breeding bin, your bedding is going to be nowhere near this deep. I hope you can tell as I get deeper in this bin, the depth of the color darkens, showing increased moisture, increased number of worms near the bottom as well and the material itself was getting a little compressed. According to the research study, worms breathe through their skin, so they need a moist environment, and the research cited range of about 60 to 85% moisture. Worms are actually made up of about 80% moisture themselves, and they secrete a mucus on their skin that will retain moisture around them locally. You'll see worms clustered together if they experience overly dry conditions. So if you see a tight little worm ball and your bin is dry, that very well could be the cause. Worms will also cluster together in other types of stress like high temperature, high barometric pressure, a toxic environment, and so on. If you don't have a reliable moisture meter, just feel with your hands and it, the material should feel moist and crumbly, but not soggy and wet. If you want to see what happens when a worm bin gets a rainstorm on it, I'll put a link to my previous video in the description that shows what happens when the castings get really muddy and fudgy and what I did to correct the problem. A wet bin from exposure to rainfall is nowhere near as serious as a wet bin from overfeeding. Rain is just harmless water and the problem can be corrected through the addition of carbon. Overfeeding takes a few more steps to rectify your bin. One of the reasons you may want to bulk up the bedding depth of a worm bin is to resist swings in temperature but also to resist swings in moisture. As I said, the bottom, bottom end of that range, according to research, is about 50%. The research shows worms can tolerate this by doing that stress response for about a month, any longer than that, and it would provide uh, a lethal condition for the worms. My digging into the research showed that it's not a one size fits all for worms when it comes to moisture. Not only does the level of moisture vary with the worm's development, but also other factors like bedding and food. Not surprisingly, juvenile worms have a narrower range of moisture than their adult counterparts. Juvenile worms, which would be for those of you who have a grow out bin, prefer moisture of about 65 to 70%, those nice fluffy worm bins that we all know. And this is where the research gets really fascinating. Optimum moisture for clitellum development. Seems like it's actually a stress to the worms. If moisture levels drop to 55 to 60%, worms are more likely to develop into breeding adults. At least they are more likely to do it more quickly. 
The researchers are talking about the development of the clitellum here, and it seems that the development of the clitellum is distinct from when these worms actually start producing cocoons. That's where the different layers of a worm bin, like I've got here, come into play. An adult worm is most likely to develop a clitellum under 65% moisture. It is most likely to start producing cocoons at much higher humidity levels, 75% and above. Now the researchers didn't get into it, but the scientist in me has to say, well, is that increased moisture for cocoon production because the moisture transmits the chemicals that allow worms to find each other and breed? Don't worry, I'll probably find that out and report on it in one of my upcoming worm science videos. Now, I said there were other factors that combined with moisture levels to influence their survivability, growth, and reproduction of worms. Both these studies looked at cattle manure and pig manure, but I'll try to relate it back to what you might be doing in your own bins. Pig manure has a naturally occurring higher nitrogen content than cattle manure, and it's this higher nitrogen content that the researchers hypothesize led to the worms producing the most cocoons and the most hatchlings per cocoon at a moisture level of about 80%. With cattle manure, the most cocoons and the most hatchlings occurred at a moisture level of about 75%. So why does pig manure need higher moisture to produce cocoons? It seems that the high nitrogen content of the bedding becomes toxic to the worms, especially under 75% moisture. The higher nitrogen content of pig manure bedding is toxic to worms at all moisture levels that were tested by these researchers, but most pronounced under 75%. At 70%, it becomes 100% fatal. Only a small percentage of us are going to be feeding pig manure to our worms, so how does this relate to what you or I might experience? Well, there are other high nitrogen beddings. I put a chart in that worm science video I did on carbon to nitrogen ratios of common beddings and their carbon to nitrogen ratio. The lower the first number, the lower amount of carbon, the more likely you are to introduce a high nitrogen bedding to your worms. And this research showed without sufficient moisture in the bin, a high nitrogen bedding is toxic to worms. Of course, food is the most common way we introduce high nitrogen into our bins. My takeaway from this research is dry foods like worm chow and coffee grounds could create unfavorable nitrogen conditions if the worm bin is especially dry. Wet sloppy food scraps can also create high nitrogen and anaerobic conditions. You will smell it if that ever starts happening in a worm bin. So with pig manure though, that high nitrogen content, if the worm survives the moisture level, it actually produces more growth in those worms. Worms will grow up bigger and faster in higher nitrogen conditions. They just have to get over the survivability hurdle. The final factor are the carbon to nitrogen ratios. Pig manure starts with a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So as the bin matures, that ratio is going to drop more quickly. Having lower carbon in the bin is going to provide less of a buffer for the worms to tolerate dropping moisture conditions. Basically, the nitrogen is going to be amplified by the dry, low carbon conditions. You'll see I'm giving Cinderella lots of carbon here and a food scrap feeding on top that I'm just going to distribute a little bit to get the moisture in those layers of paper towels, toilet rolls, and tissues. So back to why I'm not worried about this worm bin being a little on the dry side. This is a mature worm bin. The castings that are in here are full of that mucus secretions from the worms that is going to retain the moisture level. I'm not e expecting wild swings in the moisture level. Our summer is coming to a close, so we don't have the high temperatures outside anymore which is another factor that's going to slow the evaporative loss from this bin. The research I looked at did make me wonder whether all this fluffing is actually going to lead to more worm growth and reproduction in the long run. I always talk about distributing the moisture in a bin, but it seems that the worms actually prefer different layers of moisture 
If you watch Bentley Christie, he did a set it and forget it bin and didn't open the lid for four months and the worms were just fine and the material was beautiful. Many of us practice no dig gardening. So is there such a thing as no fluff worm bins? I'm not sure, but if you're like me, you like playing with these little guys. Cinderella seems to be a little on the dry side right now, but from my forays into this research, that indicates to me that more of the worms are going to start developing clotellum, which should lead to more breeding once the moisture levels increase. Because I did find some compressed castings down the bottom in the beginning, I know there's moisture in this bin. So the little juveniles that need 65 to 70% moisture will be just fine. You can see how easily this material comes off my hands. So there's not a lot of stickiness or muddiness to it. Cinderella's bubble wrap doesn't create a tight seal on the top either. So I'll keep an eye on the moisture levels. All right, everyone, Prince Charming goes back. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.